Thank you, uh, and thanks to the organisers for uh, allowing me a, a slot at today's uh, investor show. Um, I'd just like to pay tribute as well to the previous speaker. Having worked with Crispin for many years at Biocompatibles, that was uh, an absolute delight. Okay, so moving on to Renewron, uh, there's your standard disclaimer, um, as we are a public company. Uh, we're actually an AIM listed company and we're involved in uh, stem cell therapeutics. Um, we've developed what we think is a commercial approach to harnessing stem cell science and converting that into uh, uh, therapeutics that can be delivered to broad patient populations. So we're using allogeneic stem cell technology. Allogeneic means you can develop stem cells that can be applied across patient groups rather than having to use the patient's own stem cells. So something that um, perhaps almost by, by definition would allow a more commercial uh, and larger scale approach to developing these, uh, these therapies. Um, as a company, we're, we're focused on uh, vascular conditions such as stroke disability and critical limb ischemia. Uh, we're also more recently now um, getting involved in ophthalmology, uh, in particular retinitis pigmentosa, which I'll come back to. Um, and that's an orphan fast track program. Uh, and I'll come back to what those uh, actually mean or what they could do for us uh, when I get to that program in a second. Um, we're a clinical stage business, so we have a number of clinical trials running now. Uh, with retinitis pigmentosa, we've just started our first US clinical trial, which is a, a big milestone for us as a business. Um, we have a phase two study ongoing here in the UK in stroke disability, uh, and also a first in man phase one study, uh, again in the UK, in critical limb ischemia. Um, we're also uh, pioneering a new field of therapeutics based on exosomes, which we can harvest from our cell lines. And again, if there's time at the end, I'll try and describe what exosomes are. As a non-scientist, that might be quite difficult, but I'll give it a go. Um, as a business, we're, we're well-backed and well-funded. Uh, I've listed the key investors here. These uh, are obviously pretty significant institutions, both generalist and specialist life science institutions. Um, as of our last half-year reporting date, we have just over 70 million uh, pounds on the balance sheet, uh, no debt. Um, so we're probably one of the better funded biotech companies in the UK right now. And importantly, that will enable us to achieve a number of key milestones over the next two to three years in terms of getting clinical data, meaningful clinical data from phase two and even phase three clinical studies in those key uh, programs I've just mentioned. So some real scope to, to build value through cold, hard clinical data, which we hope will be positive data, uh, using the money that we have on the balance sheet. So that's a, that's a, a, a very positive step forward for us uh, uh, by virtue of funding that we completed last year, actually. So why stem cells? And well, again, without um, boring you too much with the science, uh, I think most of us are aware of stem cells and what they, what they are. They are essentially nature's building blocks. Um, we all have them. Uh, our capacity to generate them diminishes over time. The key thing is, can we harness stem cell science and convert them into stem cell therapies um, that are going to be clinically effective and cost effective in terms of having healthcare systems pay for them to really address some of the underlying uh, causes of disease, these very intractable diseases where conventional drugs, be they small molecules or biologics, have just not worked. Um, and the notion here is that stem cells can either replace damaged tissue or they can send signals to neighbouring cells to engender endogenous repair, so to essentially kickstart repair processes that already exist in the body. Um, for us, we've developed two key stem cell assets over the years. One is called CTX. It's a neural cell line, and we're deploying that both in our vascular programs and also as a, as a, as a producer cell line for our exosomes. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, our second cell asset is called HRPC. That stands for human retinal progenitor cells. And unsurprisingly, we're targeting those retinal cells at retinal degenerative diseases, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, being the first target, as I mentioned. Um, just a quick word on CTX. What do we mean by a cell therapy product? Well, CTX is a GMP validated, so good manufacturing practice validated, cryopreserved human neural stem cell product. Uh, it has a six month shelf life, so we can cryopreserve it. It then goes into a cryo shipper, which is that object you see on the left there, uh, gets shipped to the hospital or the clinical site, and it can be stored um, in uh, vapor phase nitrogen for as long, well, currently on a six month shelf life, but conceivably much longer than that once we garner the data, and then can be thawed and then used as required. So it's a modality that's much more akin to a standard biopharmaceutical product, even though we're actually dealing with uh, living cells here. 
So what's our therapeutic pipeline? Uh, well, we have three core programs, as mentioned, uh, stroke, uh, limb ischemia, and retinitis pigmentosa. And our exosome program at the bottom there is in its research phase. Um, white is what we've completed. Uh, blue is currently what's ongoing. And sort of green or light green is where we're looking to take these individual programs with the money that we already have on the balance sheet uh, uh, in the bank. Okay, so just touching on the programs individually briefly, uh, retinitis pigmentosa uh, uh, is an inherited degenerative eye disease. What happens is what you see in the image there, it's a gradual loss of peripheral vision, ultimately leading to blindness over a period of years. Um, it's what you would characterize as a large orphan status disease. So the, 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 the incidence, or the prevalence rather, uh, is around 275,000 patients. And that's important because we actually have orphan drug designation for this program, both in Europe and in the US, and we have fast track designation by FDA in the US, the US regulator. That's important because it will speed the regulatory pathway for this program, and if we can get this product to market, um, the orphan drug designation means that we may garner a number of years market exclusivity if there are no better products available at that time. So um, this program has some very considerable advantages for, from a commercial standpoint. As I mentioned, we've just started a phase one, two study uh, in the US, in Boston, um, and all being well, that will lead to a phase two, three uh, pivotal study, pre-market application study, uh, uh, at some point next year. So this really does have the capacity to be a very swift uh, program to get this treatment, uh, ultimately, we hope, uh, to market. Um, moving on to stroke or our vascular programs, the first of which uh, is stroke. And as you saw from the last presentation, uh, stroke is a very, very significant cause of adult disability, has an extremely high prevalence and incidence in the developed world and beyond. Uh, and the annual health and social care costs associated with stroke survivors are very, very substantial indeed, especially in the US. There are no pharmaceutical treatment options for stroke beyond uh, alteplase, which is the only marketed treatment, has to be administered within the first few hours post-stroke. So most patients will just not get to the hospital in time to benefit from that treatment. Um, we've published preclinical data over many years demonstrating the preclinical efficacy of our CTX cells in animal models of stroke. And uh, again, the, the notion here is to improve recovery in disabled stroke survivors, to give them a more independent quality of life and make them less reliant on health and social care. That's where the pharmacoeconomic argument is uh, for this intervention. So where have we got to with it? Well, we, uh, we've completed a phase one study that was done in the UK uh, 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 two or three years or so back. Um, it involves a single straightforward neurosurgical procedure to get the cells in. So the patients will typically stay in a hospital for one or two nights uh, just to monitor for uh, 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 that they're okay post-procedure and then they're back home. And in the case of the 11 patients we treated up in Glasgow, we saw no cell-related or immune-related adverse events and we did see encouraging results across the multiple efficacy measures that we took in this study. Even though it was essentially a safety study, we were monitoring for efficacy measures uh, on a two-year uh, uh, follow-up. Um, that uh, study will, will be going in for publication very shortly in a, in a notable journal. Um, and in, in the meantime, we've started a phase two study, or actually it's ongoing now, uh, in the UK across 10 sites up and down the country. Uh, and the important addition in this phase two study is something known as the Action Research Arm Test, which you see in the image at the bottom there, if you can see that. And that merely, as a primary endpoint, it measures the patient's ability to perform a useful task with the affected side of the body. And as you heard in uh, the previous presentation, stroke typically affects you down one side of the body. Uh, uh, if you survive a stroke and are left disabled by it. So this, this endpoint measures the patient's ability pre and post treatment to lift an object from desk height onto a platform, simple as that. So a very objective measure, you can film it, and something that's very indicative, uh, we believe, of efficacy uh, in this treatment at that target population. Uh, we're looking to get the phase two data uh, around about the middle part of this year, hopefully in, in, in the first half. Um, and all being well, uh, that will lead into a phase two, three pivotal study and we'll be using the totality of the phase one and the phase two data to make our application to the regulators to start that study, we hope, uh, uh, before the end of this year. So again, this program is moving rapidly now towards its uh, late stage uh, clinical phase. Uh, in terms of, just checking the time here, in terms of uh, critical limb ischemia, uh, 
CLI is a loss of blood flow to the lower limb. So again, it's another vascular condition, and we know our CTX cells are very good at promoting blood flow, so this was an obvious target for those cells. Um, again, very high incidence <coughs> associated with, with uh, uh, CLI, and that's because the vast majority of CLI patients will be diabetics. Uh, it's a classic side effect uh, of uh, diabetes. Um, so again, a very large economic burden on healthcare systems. The only real option of available at the moment is revascularization surgery around the, um, uh, uh, the blood vessels that are lost in the lower limb. Uh, but a lot of patients are ineligible for that because of wound healing problems as a result of their diabetes. So um, in terms of clinical activity here, we have a UK phase one study ongoing at the moment. Again, that should read out around uh, the middle part of this year and will and we'll lead, we hope, into a phase two study uh, uh, before the end of this year, a control, placebo controlled phase two study. Um, and we believe that an allogeneic or non-patient specific treatment is particularly important in CLI um, because the time of intervention, the time you actually treat these patients is very, very important. If you leave it too early, you're unlikely to get a good result. And similarly, if you leave it too late, the patient will probably go on for amputation, onto amputation anyway. So the ability to have a cell therapy treatment waiting there at site, which can simply be thawed and administered very quickly, exactly when needed, uh, we think could be a real benefit. And of course, our CTX product uh, does offer that. Okay, so um, just to move on very quickly to our exosome nanomedicine program, and this was somewhat um, serendipitous. We were actually exploring putative mechanisms of action for our CTX cells, and we believe that exosomes may play a role in giving CTX its therapeutic benefits. Um, and then we cottoned on to the fact that exosomes themselves may be useful therapeutic agents if you can harvest them and purify them in a consistent way. And of course, because we're, heart, we're, we're manufacturing CTX in large quantities now for our CTX-based clinical trials, we can harvest the exosomes and purify them. And we're actually making good progress in doing just that uh, at a GMP level. So these are clinical grade exosomes, if you will. Um, and we filed a, no a large number of patents around exosomes harvest from our neural cell line. Um, and we are currently looking at how we can exploit uh, exosomes, both as delivery vehicles for genes in gene therapy and also as therapeutic agents in their own right. And the primary target is likely to be cancer, so it takes us into a new uh, area of, uh, a significant area of disease. And why cancer? Well, we did some early work um, to look, and this was primarily to see that the exosomes weren't actually cancer inducing, but what we found quite surprisingly was the fact that they had very significant anti-cancer properties. And I've just snapshot a little a bit of early in vitro data, and this is very early data, so we don't want to read too much into it at this stage, but it's encouraging nonetheless. And what you see here in the graph and in the images is an untreated tumour in a dish, if you will, uh, and that's the green line. And as you can see, over the, as the days progress, the tumour just keeps growing, as you can see in the series of panels uh, top to bottom on the left-hand side there. We also used an active control, which was a PI, uh, P13 kinase inhibitor. Uh, and as you can see, if you can on the red line there, as long as you're dosing that uh, agent, you can hold back the growth of the tumour. As soon as you stop treating the uh, tumour, though, uh, with that agent, you can see the tumour growth starts growing again. What we saw with the exosome-treated tumours was very interesting. For the first sort of two or three weeks, nothing much happens. It tracks the control. But at about day 18 to 21, suddenly those tumours collapse, as you see in the, uh, the right-hand series of images there. And all you're left with is cellular debris. And we thought, well, that's, there must be some kind of mistake here. But actually, that blue line is the mean of five different experiments. And indeed, what we've done is, is repeat this in, a, in a, actually a tumour model in animals. So we do have some in vivo data now as well, and we see a similar effect. So there's definitely something going on here. And what we believe might be going on is that the exosomes are programming cancer cells to adopt a normal cycle of cell death, apoptosis in other words. Um, but suffice to say, there's a lot more work to be done here to validate these early uh, data. But nonetheless, uh, we draw a, 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 a good bit of encouragement from them. So all being well, and we're putting our plans together at the moment, if we can repeat and validate the, these data, then we'd be looking to get a first-in-man study underway at some point, we hope, uh, next year. I've got a minute left. So um, just to wrap up quickly then, 
Um, the milestones that you see here take us right the way through calendar 2018. These are all funded milestones, starting with the CTX programs at the top there in blue, uh, the retinal program uh, in light blue, and, and finally, more speculatively, the exosome program at the bottom. And as you can see, in the case of certainly stroke and RP, um, within our current funded window, we can take those programs all being well, right the way through their clinical development cycle to the point of market application. So really significant uh, scope here to build value through generation of data, which is really how value should be built, frankly, in biotech. And those data all being well uh, will then lead to commercial transactions, of course, the classic biotech exit model. Um, just a quick nod to the management team and the board here, which we've developed over time, and we have the breadth of skill sets now across all the key functions of the business. Uh, that money that we raise has allowed us to, uh, to really develop our, our senior team, and um, uh, we're delighted to have some of the, some of the, 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 the people that you see here, uh, a real quality team, both in the, in, if you like, in the day-to-day -day management of the business and, of course, at non-executive level as well. So just to wrap up then, uh, Renuron has differentiated stem cell technology uh, with the prospect of a scalable and cost-effective approach to cell therapy. We have a strong competitive position in our field, with, which is obviously characterized by very high barriers to entry. We're targeting significant diseases characterized by being, well, really unmet medical needs. We're building a clinical stage portfolio. We have three, or will have three phase two trials completed or in progress within the next 12 months. We're well backed and well funded to achieve that. I think we have a really great management team now uh, and because of the above significant op opportunity to build value beyond the whatever it is 100 million or so that we're currently valued at uh, over that two to three year time horizon. And with that, I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Thank you.